it's been a big, big, blessed week. Um, my grandson called me last night, my oldest grandson, Red. He called me last night, and uh, he got saved. So that's awesome. He is six years old. He accepted Christ. Um, he and I had a conversation on Thursday or Friday night, I believe it was, um, after the after t after t ball game, and uh, we're coming home, and and uh, he's going to Awana, so he's learning the scriptures, and understanding about what it means to be saved, and so uh, we talked about that, and uh, um, we had a uh, we come we conversed all the way, and he's a lot smarter than I give him credit for. And uh, he called me last night, and he had talked with his mom and daddy, and they had prayed. He had prayed to receive Christ in his heart, and that's just exciting to me. Uh, thankful for that. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Stand to your feet as we read, okay? Again, we're talking about uh, resurrection encounters. We're talking about... Uh, what it really means, now we're talking, you know, in John chapter 11, we said that the word says that, it, that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection. We know that the resurrection is, a, is an event that happened where Jesus came back to life, but the, Jesus said about himself, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, uh, you know, he'll never die. So we understand that. And today we want to finish talking. We've been just, we've been just looking at different instances in the Word of God where, uh, you know, there was an encounter with the resurrection. And I'm trying to encourage, just as we've seen Miss Anita do today uh, in her uh, little video that she made, which I was just blessed by, um, I'm in trying to encourage us to think about our resurrection encounter. When did we encounter Jesus? How we uh, came to know him and when we came to know him and how, how that has impacted and continues to impact our life and change us. So we're talking in, in uh, Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, we're talking about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Look at verse 13 of chapter 24 of Luke. It says, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. Uh, so here we are, these men are traveling on this, it's about a seven mile trip, it's about a two or three hour walk, if you would, so they're conversing back and forth about what's happened, about the fact that Jesus has been crucified, uh, you know, and, and, some, and you know, the fact that the women have went and they've came and they said, listen, you know, we went to the tomb, he's not there, all these things. Uh, it says there in verse 15, so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Verse 17, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we are hoping that it was he who, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and the certain and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us uh, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Verse 25, then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went uh, in to stay with them. Verse 30, Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. 
And they said to one another, uh, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And finally, verse 35, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for this time together. Thank you for your holy word. And Lord, I pray today that it would become the engrafted word and it would we'd take it home with us and it would change us and mold us and make us into your people. God, may we uh, be reminded of our own resurrection encounter. May we be re- reminded of how, uh, what, what, it hap- what happened when we met Jesus Christ as our Savior and how uh, that encounter changed our lives and how, uh, Lord, it drawn us, drawed us, drew us to him and, Lord, how we continue to grow in our faith one day at a time. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Be seated real quickly. So we've already talked about some of this passage and want to particularly uh, begin in verse number 25. Verse number 25, so that's where we'll begin today, talking about uh, now we've read the story, we understand that what's happening here is Jesus, uh, a, a, as a stranger, has come to these disciples, these two disciples. It's not one of the apostles. It is, uh, it is a follower of Jesus, a disciple. It's Cleopas, and then one other. We're not, it's not identified who the other person is, but uh, they're on this road, and they're traveling. They're having this conversation back and forth about what's happened, about Jesus and what's happened to him. And, and so all of a sudden, this stranger just comes alongside them and begins begins and asks them these questions, you know, about why are you sad? What's going on with you guys? And then they, uh, you know, he says, you know, what are you talking about? And they said, listen, you're a stranger and, and you've been in Jerusalem. You don't know about this, what's happened, that Jesus Christ was, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, he was crucified and all these things. And he talks about that. And then we finally come down to verse 25 of chapter 24. And we're talking about resurrection encounters, and we're talking about a stranger. So in verses 25 through 27, if you're taking notes, here's the the next point under that, the unearthing stranger, unearthing, yes, unearthing stranger. And here's what I mean by that. Unearthing is this. It's the process of finding something in the ground by digging or excavating. Now, I want you to think about that just a minute. Now, I'm around building a lot, not, you know, quite a bit, not as much as I used to be as far as new construction, those kind of things years ago. But, um, you know, you have a, a backhoe. I think of Tommy Pope when I think of a backhoe because he, man, he can run a backhoe just like nobody else can. But anyway, and, and he can take that backhoe. I remember him working on my uncle's. Uh, he was putting a septic tank in for him, and it was on the side of a hill. And literally, um, there's trees and all kind of stuff around And literally, he used the bucket, the front bucket and the back bucket on that back hole to climb up and down that hill and dig those fill lines and do all those things. It was amazing to watch him do that. Um, And then I think about, you know, as I think about archaeologists who who go on these uh, finds and they dig in the earth to find treasures and they, you know, there's been many uh, things that have been found that prove uh, events in the Word of God. Um, I, I think recently there was... Uh, pilot, there was uh, some uncovering of, and they were discovered that, yes, you know, we already knew it was true because the Bible says it, but anyway, there's actual proof that there was a pilot. You know, we talk about Pontius Pilate, and it, it tells, talks about the history of that and all those kind of things. So we're talking about unearthing, and here you'll understand as we go through this passage what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, we think about the Word of God in this passage, as we're going to see in a minute. Um, how do we study it? I mean, how do we get to know it? I mean, uh, it's one thing for us to read the Bible every day, and that's fine. Listen, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that, you know, but there are truths, there are treasures in the Word of God. And for you to get those, it takes more than just skimming through that. You have to dig, you have to excavate, and you have to dig down and, and, and uncover some things that are there that you don't just see maybe on the surface. So we're going to see in this passage how this stranger who is Jesus, although they don't know it's Jesus, he uh, basically, he excavates or digs up the truths uh, of the scriptures to help them to understand who Jesus really is. Now again, let's look at this, the unearthing, everybody say unearthing. 
so you know what unearthing means. Here we go. The str this stranger, Jesus, is about to unearth or dig up or excavate the truths found in their, uh, in their available. Now, listen, they don't have the whole word of God. You know, they don't have, they have, uh, you know, some, they have some the Psalms and some of the, uh, the prophets, some of their writings. So they don't have the whole word of God like we have. But he's talking about uh, from Moses on, you'll see that he reveals himself through those scriptures and he, and he helps him to understand that. So first of all, in verse 25, 26, we see his rebuke, his rebuke. Now, again, Jesus is conversing with them. They're talking back and forth. And, and all of a sudden in verse 25, uh, the word says this. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. That's verse 25. Then he said to them, so Jesus began to speak to the two disciples concerning their words. O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Here's what that means. You unintelligent, unwise, foolish, and dull of thought, mind and heart, to have faith in every spoken word that the inspired foretellers of God. In other words, you know, why are you so slow to believe what the, what the, what the prophets have said? Why are you not willing to understand and listen and, under, and believe those things? You're not listening to the inspired uh, speakers of God. Then he says, Ought not the Christ to have suffered the things and to enter into his glory? Now remember, they, they have, Jesus has asked him the question about what things you're talking about. They said, oh, we're talking about Jesus. You know, uh, the fact that he was a mighty prophet. He was, he done all these mighty works. And, and, and then the religious leaders, you know, they took him for Pilate and they crucified him and all these things. And now he's about to, again, he's about to unearth the scripture. He's about to, he's about to reveal to them the truths about himself. He's about to help them to understand. Remember, remember what was going on? We started with, we said that they did not understand. They couldn't understand why, why, you know, Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah. He's supposed to be the one that God had promised, and yet, you know, we just seen him die. We just seen him kill him. They, they nailed him to a cross. He's dead. And then, all, then these women are coming and tell us that, no, he's not. You know, he's back to life now. He's, he's resurrected. He's not dead. So they, they really don't understand what's going on. They need some understanding, some clarity about what's going on. Now, I don't know about you in your life, but there's a lot of times in my life when I need some clarity about what's going on. I need some understanding to help me to know what, what God is saying or what he wants from me in a particular situation. You know, how does he want me to, to, uh, you know, to maneuver through, these, through this life in which we're living right now and this craziness and all this stuff is going on? And this stranger is about, again, he's, he first of all starts out with this rebuke and he, he really kind of gets on to these, to these disciples here, his followers here. It, it's ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Was it not necessary for the, Messiah, the anointed Messiah to have experienced this death and suffering you have said happened to Jesus? See, what he does is he connects the dots for these guys. They, they, they uh, you know, they're, they're kind of understanding a little bit about Jesus. They know he's uh, from God and they, they believe he's a, he was the Messiah. And, all, and now what's, what's happening is, is Jesus takes them through this Bible study. Isn't it neat to think about that Jesus himself, here's these men, and what he does is he takes the scripture and he takes, uh, he, he, he's, he basically tells them the story about himself, who he was, you know, why he was here, the fact that he died, the fact that, you know, he was going to suffer and all these things, and then he was going to be glorified as we, as we know, as we see. And he just helps them to understand all those things. He reveals those things to them. Was it not necessary for the anointed Messiah to have experienced the death suffering you have said happened to Jesus? Then also afterward to come to his position of honor, praise, and worship. So not only his rebuke, but in verse 27 we see his revelation. It says, in beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded. There's the word. Everybody say expounded. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So starting with Moses and every one of God's inspired speakers, Jesus explained thoroughly, interpreted, excavated the truths in all the writings inspired by God with respect to the Messiah. In other words, what Jesus did, he, he, he just began just giving it out to him. He told him exactly what the truth was about himself about the Messiah, how it was supposed to happen, how he's supposed to die, how he's supposed to rise again the third day, and all these things. Jesus just told them all about those things. And, and he didn't just tell them about it. He, he, he helped them to understand exactly all. In other words, it, wasn't, it wasn't confusing for them anymore. 
See, God gives us the, the Holy Spirit to help us to understand today as believers. Jesus is not here in the body, right? He's, he's in heaven. He's praying for us, making intercession for us. But the Spirit of God is here with us to be our teacher. He teaches us into all truths as we study and we pray and we, we ask the Spirit of God to reveal his word to us and to help us to understand. Today, when we come together, we sung about the Holy Spirit a while ago. At, and, and we, you know, our goal is for, for the Spirit of God to teach us from the word of God, the truths of God, you know, so we might be changed by it, right? That's our purpose as we come. Jesus uh, meets them where they are. He begins to reveal himself to them by taking the scriptures and he just basically says all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus gives him a Bible study about the Messiah, about the one that God had promised to come. So Jesus started with Moses and explained every truth of scripture. No more need for understanding. Think about it. No more need for understanding. Jesus is their Messiah. Jesus led them in a Bible study about himself. All their questions were answered. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just, if we could just read the Bible and we just understood everything? Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if we could just read it and we just know it like, okay, I got it. It's just not that simple, is it? I mean, listen, I, uh, it's, it's difficult. You know, God wants us to be willing to do the thing that Jesus did. He wants us to dig it out. To, re to reach in there to try to get it. To, and, and, you know, isn't it amazing? The Bible says iron sharpens iron. So when we come together, every time we come together, you know, when it, whether it's small groups or Wednesday nights, whatever, we, get, we have an opportunity so that maybe, maybe Tom is here and he, and he sees the truth in the Word of God and he shares that with everybody else. And then somebody else sees the truth and they share it with somebody else. And, we, and, you know, it's just a time where we come together and we learn together and we grow together and we're able to understand some things that we didn't know before. So we see his revelation, and then the next point we see is the unmistakable stranger. Everybody say unmistakable. Now, unmistakable is this. It is clear, visible, or obvious. Now, up to this point, you know, remember, the Bible says early on that their eyes were restrained. They could not see, even though Jesus is with them, and it, which is kind of weird because we said, man, they know who Jesus is. They've seen him. They followed after him. They've seen him do miracles. Not only that, but they've heard him. So he's talking to them, they see him, and yet they don't know who he is. Now that's something that only God could do, right? God, God restrains them. He, he, he keeps them from being able to recognize who his son Jesus is in this passage. So we see the unmistakable stranger. Again, clear, visible, obvious to this point. Again, their, their eyes are restrained. And then we see in verses 28 and 29, we see their welcome. Everybody say welcome. So... They've had, this, they've had this conversation with the stranger. Um, you know, they, didn't, they don't know who he is, but he's revealed to them about, about God and about Jesus himself, about the Messiah. And so they're kind of getting to know them. So they, get to their, they finally get to where they're going. They're getting to their home. And so they're about to go in, and they think, you know what? Why don't we invite this guy in? So they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, this guy's status from being a stranger to being a guest is about to happen. So the Bible says there in verse uh, 30, Verse 28, it talks about, uh, we see they're welcome. They, they, you know, they were almost home, so they find their friend. It says in verse 29, but they constrained him. Uh, they, they wanted to ask him to stay. It, it's Jesus, uh, the stranger, appeared as though he was going to keep going. He was not going to come and stay. The Bible says in verse 29, but they constrained him. Now, constrains there, I, I read some, some meanings on the word constrain there. Uh, in the Hebrew or in the Greek rather um, and it really talks about uh, to change the course or to change by force and now what I would say here is the word that I think we should use is the word compel they these two men compel Jesus Jesus is going to go on his way he's not going to stop and stay but but we can understand that he compelled them or they pleaded with him to stay they they basically begged him to stay or they you know they wanted him to stay they compelled him to stay um, they wanted him to stay with them. And it goes on, it says, saying, abide with us, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. Pleading with him to stay there with them because it was late and getting dark. Dark time was coming. And it says, and he, he went in to stay with them. So they begged and pleaded or compelled Jesus to stay. And so he decided he would come in and stay with them. Jesus, 
I, well, the truth that I, I wrote this down, I thought Jesus will not force himself into our lives. He waits to be invited. Then he abides with us. Think about it. Here are these men. They've, they've been with Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus. You know, he's a stranger. Now he's a guest. They've invited him to come in. Um, but he wouldn't come in unless they asked him to come. Can I just say this to all of us? Jesus will not force himself on anybody. And, and listen, no matter who you are today, Jesus will never force himself upon you. But if you invite him, if you invite him, he will come in and abide with you and stay with you. Now it can, in verse 30, it says here, um, not only did they offer him a place to stay, but verse 30 it says that but they decided not only they're going to offer him a place to stay, but they're going to offer him to eat with them, a meal. He's going to be, uh, you know, he's going to be their guest. They're going to offer him to eat supper with them, if you would. And it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their guest, Jesus, turns into the host. The Bible says there that Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And what happened? Here's what happened. All of a sudden, they remembered that they had seen this before. They had experienced this before. And the Bible says that their eyes were opened and they knew that it was Jesus. See, they had broke bread with Jesus before. And he evidently he had a specific way that he did it and a way about doing that. And as soon as they seen him doing that, they, their eyes were opened and they recognized that it was Jesus. All this time, all this time they've been talking to a stranger. All this time they've been, they've been taught by a stranger. He's told them the truths of God's word about the Messiah. And all it took was for them to sit down and to start breaking bread and Jesus to do what he always does to break it and to bless it and to pass it to them and their eyes verse 31 says then their eyes were opened and they knew him after this their restrained eyes were opened and they recognized it was Jesus and he vanished from their sight then Jesus disappeared out of their sight. Isn't that weird? Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that cool? Jesus, they see him, they recognize it's Jesus, and all of a sudden he's gone. He vanished out of sight. He's not there anymore. Kind of sounds a little, you know, I don't know, out there somewhere to think about that. But here's Jesus with them, and then all of a sudden he's not there anymore. He's gone. He's gone out of their sight. And then we see in verse 32, we're almost done. Verse 32, we see their words. Everybody say words. So think about these men. They're having this encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Now they really know it's him. Now they know the one who taught them the truth of the scripture was really Jesus. Now they understand that he is, he is the one. And we see verse 32, we see their words. Do not our, did not our hearts burn within us? What does that mean? Did not our hearts burn within us? Were not both of our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions? That word heart there is the word cardia. You know, we, we know what cardiac, you know what a cardiac event is when you have something to go with your heart? Cardia is the, is the Greek word there. Were not both our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions? You see, in the, uh, for them, when you think about cardia there, it's talking about not only the mind, but the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings. Every, all of that is, is kind of clumped in together. The, in the, the center of who they are, all those things was about who they are. And he says, did not we burn? Did not we burn our thoughts, feelings, emotions? Were they not set on fire inside of us? while he talked with us on the road. They knew something was different about this man. They didn't know it was Jesus. They knew something was different. And then while he opened the scriptures to us, we, we didn't really know who it was, but man, on the inside, we're getting this truth and we're understanding it and, we're, and it's being explained to us and it's, it's just doing something to us. Isn't that how it is with the word of God and how God, when he, when he teaches us and helps us to understand? You ever just been in a moment where... Uh, all of a sudden, just a light clicks on about a truth from God's word, and you're like, wow. 
That's cool. I was talking to my grandson, and we were talking back and forth, and he's very smart, and he was just talking to me about different things, talking about rent, and, uh, you know, we were talking about heaven. And he said, well, what happens if you don't, if you don't trust Jesus? I said, well, there's two places that you can go when you die. And I said, one is heaven and the other is hell. And, and his little mind, six years old, I mean, he just soaked that up and he just took it in. I'm sure he, did, he doesn't understand all that, but he said, he said, so what happens, Papa, about if, if, a, um, you know, if somebody don't understand about Jesus and they die? I said, well, you know, you're talking about like Bobo. I said, Bobo's, Bobo's three. And I said, well, Bobo's not old enough. He doesn't understand what's right and wrong. He doesn't understand that he needs Jesus. I said, but Rhett does. Rhett understands he needs Jesus. See, their words, while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us, our hearts burn within us. Then we see verses 33 through 35, their witness. Wit Everybody say witness. They rose up that very hour, verse 33 says. No time to waste. They had to tell their brethren. They didn't, they didn't want to wait for another day. They're, they just got home. They just got home. I mean, they walked this, this two or three hour walk from, uh, you know, Jerusalem to, to Emmaus. And now, you know, they, they've just, they, they, remember their hearts burn within them. They can't sleep. They got to get up. They got to go tell somebody about what they've seen. They can't wait for tomorrow. They can't wait for another time. They know now that Jesus is alive. They know that Jesus is resurrected. They know that he's the Messiah. He's the one that they've been, they knew it. They, they, they felt it. They, they believed he was the Messiah. Now they know for sure that he's the one. And they have to go tell somebody. They have to go back to their brethren who's in Jerusalem. That two or three hour walk back. I wonder what their conversation was like going back that two or three hours. I, I bet they got there before two or three hours. I bet it was more like a, a, a faster, you know, return trip there. No time to waste. They had to tell their brethren. And then verse 34, it says there, um, after they got there, it says, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And we'll get back to that another time. Look at verse 35. And they told about the things they had, that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So they witnessed. They, they came to the, to the brethren, the, the eleven and the others who were there with them, and they told them exactly what had happened and what they seen and the fact that they had met Jesus. And he had, he had, he had been with them in the breaking of bread and how he had opened the scriptures up to them about himself. See, resurrection encounters, when we meet the risen Lord Jesus, we won't be the same. We won't be the same. Our words will be different. They'll be pointing to him. Our witness will be quick. We'll be ready to tell somebody else about what Jesus has done for us. I want you to bow your head just for a moment. You know, every Sunday, we come to this time of the service where we come to a time of decision. It's a time for us, for all of us in this room, to allow the Spirit of God to examine us, to uh, search our hearts, to speak to us, to encourage us, but to challenge us. See, I don't know your heart today, and I don't know where you are with God today. I would love to assume that everybody in this room today is saved, that you know the Lord Jesus, that he is, that you've had a time in your life where you prayed to receive him into your heart. He's forgiven your sins. He's cleansed you and made you a new person. And now he's working on you every day. You're, you're going through that time uh, where he is shaping and molding and working on you and helping you like he's doing with me to be more like Jesus Christ. But I don't know that. So let me just say this first and foremost. If you don't know the Lord today, this is your time to come. In just a moment, we'll have a time of invitation, and, and you'll be able to come and just receive Jesus if that's what you need to do. 
But the rest of us who have has, had an, a resurrection encounter, we've met the risen Savior. He's saved us. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us. For those of us who's had that encounter, the challenge for us is to keep having that. We said last week that it was that this encounter, or two weeks before, we said that this was an encounter that happened. It's continuous. It's never ending. It's a relationship that evolves every day of our lives, and it's never ending. What are you doing with what Jesus has done for you. How is that encounter changing you? Not just that moment that you got saved, but what about now? How is it helping you and encouraging you in life today? Father, we come to this time, Lord, where we just trust you and know that you are in charge, that your spirit is, uh, is working and moving in the hearts and lives of your people here today. And God, you know each one of us there's no doubt that, Lord, there's, there's two types of people here today. There's those who know you and those who don't know you. And, Lord, we pray that when everybody leaves today that we'd all be in one, uh, one, one position. Lord, we'd all know you. We'd all experience you in, our, uh, in the free pardon of sin. Lord, we'd come to know you as Savior. And, Lord, I pray for, for every person here today. Lord, right where we are, God, I pray that uh, your word has met us there. And, Lord, we're not the same, that, God, maybe in just a moment we need to come and pray or maybe right where we stand in the privacy of our pew we need to pray. And we know we maybe need to just thank you, Lord. We may need to just, you know, say, Lord, this is going on in my life. This is happening. And, I, I, Lord, I need you. Will you please help me? Would you give me grace and mercy and strength, Lord, uh, for the day and for all the things that are happening? So, God, we just give you this time of decision. And, Lord, I pray you'd be honored and glorified in it all. And I pray that we'd all be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.